Hey, I'm CW4, Darren Fryer. I'm an instructor pilot here at the High Altitude Army National Guard Aviation Training Site. I teach the art of mountain flying. Come along with me for a day to see what it's like to train and fly in some of the most challenging terrain on Earth. Powers looks like it's holding steady. This is gonna be cool. We'll start in the classroom, and at the end of the day, we'll take what we've learned to the skies. It's time to go behind the wings. Welcome to the high peaks of the Rocky Mountains in Gypsum, Colorado. Today we're at HATS, the High Altitude Army National Guard Aviation Training Site. The instructors at HATS rank amongst some of the most seasoned military helicopter pilots. The type of high alpine flying and instruction is some of the most challenging in all of rotary wing aviation. HATS began in 1985, when a group of Vietnam era aviators saw the need to train younger pilots in the high alpine environment right in their backyard. The school became official in 1995. Since then, week-long classes have been held about 30 to 45 times a year. More than 400 air crews train here every year from all branches of the U.S. military, international partners, and even NASA astronauts who came to HATS to train for future planned landings on the moon. Tell me a bit about HATS and the training that you all focus on here. What makes HATS so unique? It is a schoolhouse, a one-of-a-kind schoolhouse here in the Department of Defense and we train all aviators from all branches in the art of power management. We take their helicopter that they specifically fly in and we teach them to maximize the utility of that platform without being overly conservative so that they can achieve the goals on the battlefield. Today we'll be flying the UH-72 Lakota. It's not the only aircraft you fly here. What are some of the main aircraft that you train on at HATS. Here at HATS, we do train in all four of the major combat aircraft the U.S. Army has, those being the UH-72 Lakota, UH-60 Blackhawk, CH-47F Chinook, and we do occasionally get the AH-64 Apache aviators here at the schoolhouse. And then this week's particularly cool in that we have the United States Air Force newest model, which is the UH-60 Whiskey Model Blackhawk. What makes the train so great for training power management? One is its size. It's a little over 1 million acres. We do have close to 100 named LZs. And terrain variance is its probably best attribute. And specifically, we take these students from as low as 6,500 feet here at the airport all the way up to 14,000 feet in elevation. We can replicate dusty areas that we've seen in the Middle East and maybe even the future scenarios that might come DOD's way. When we're talking about power management, I often hear about the three H's, high, hot, and heavy. Can you break that down a bit? High pertains to pressure altitude, heavy is our gross vehicle weight, and hot refers to the ambient temperature. All turbine engines in general are air-cooled engines, so the higher up we go in elevation, there's just less cooling air available to keep that engine cool and up to its maximum operating capacity. The beauty of training at altitude is you get to routinely see your engines in a degraded power scenario, and that's the crux of what HATS teaches, is to know, hey, when my engine's performance is degraded, how does that affect my mission? What's the power needed for a particular maneuver? How much power do I currently have? And then we have to make a decision whether or not we're gonna conduct that maneuver or look for a better scenario. It's only one week, but I get the impression that that's a pretty intense week for the pilots that come to HATS. The average training week, we do it 38 to 40 times a year starts off on Monday with approximately an eight hour ground school. So no flying on Monday, we just sit in the classroom and discuss all the tenets of power management. And then Tuesday through Friday, we take the classroom and make the aircraft now our classroom. It's about one of the only DOD flight training centers that does do two training sorties per day, culminating in a end of course check ride or evaluation on Friday. There's more to it than just hopping in the helicopter to fly. The day starts in the flight brief, where the crew goes over the plan for the day. Each day starts in the morning, and it starts with an instructor pilot's brief in the morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and kick this thing off. We're gonna start out with the weather, go through the risk assessment, and then get the students in here and get you all on your way. Shortly after that, the students are brought in, the students and the instructors, 
do a small table talk session. Then they roll out for training sortie number one in the AM, come back, debrief, and that's kind of a day at HATS for power management training. We're getting ready to actually take off on one of those training missions here shortly. Walk us through a bit what we can expect. We'll take off here at Eagle County Regional Airport, depart and head out to our first landing zone. We're gonna actually let the students do the entire show today. And we just let them have multiple iterations into the landing zone that we discussed this morning. And then from there, we adjust as the day goes on. So that's kind of what it looks like on the terrain board, as you saw, and now we'll go out and see it in the real world. All right, this is the part we've been waiting for. Let's see this thing fly. Eagle Tower, Talon 17 is a UH-72 on the north ramp. Ready for departure to the west. We'd like to turn out to the north. We have Bravo. There we go. Torque looks appropriate. You can go ahead and head on out. All right, so this next LZ is going to be called Dome Peak. It's basically a tall volcano looking LZ. You're going to see it here come into view shortly at the two o'clock position. So when it comes to high altitude flying, what are some of those key components that pilots come here to learn? We need to assess whether or not the landing zone is even suitable to land in. The wind is huge in the mountains because it's going to be our friend or it's going to be our enemy depending on how we set up the approach. And then finally we have those students assess the power requirements. Combination of these three things is going to allow the students to make an informed decision. Should we utilize this selected landing zone or should we not? Okay, yeah, you can see we're catching a little turbulence now. We're catching a little bit of lee side from the adjacent terrain. Just kind of hold that power where it's at and whatever you do, try not to lower the power even if you catch an updraft. Power's looking good. There's 65. That should be plenty of power. Don't pull the nose up too high. Okay. Over here? Yep, perfect. Okay. Freeman engaged. Going down. Roger. Skids are all the way down. Just go ahead and check your mass moment there. Center that up. All right. And we are down on the ground, and excellent job. That was a tough one. I wouldn't take most students here, but you guys are doing great. All right, good. Yep, I like it. All right, let's go ahead and depart, and then I'm going to give you a new number one needle here, and let's go ahead and return to the house. It's a good day. Eagle Tower, Talon 17. We are seven miles southwest, inbound to the north ramp with Tango. At the end of that course, students are out the door with approximately 7.5 hours of mountain slash power management training. Our best comment that we get out of this one week program is it's the most efficient use of aviators time anybody's seen. As the sun sets on the bustling flight ramp, we head inside to meet the dedicated maintenance crew responsible for keeping these helicopters flying. The guys in the hangar are the backbone. To be perfectly honest, without maintenance, they could not do the mission. None of this stuff is possible without the guys out here in the hangar. Is maintenance almost a daily job here? During the day while the students are out flying, if we're not helping them with maintenance on their aircraft, we're doing maintenance on our aircraft. At the end of the day, they come back, we do maintenance, we get the birds ready for the next morning and prep them for the weekend because then we have search and rescue for the weekend. So we have to always have a bird up for that. So we're pretty much working with a skeleton crew with a minimal amount of aircraft, trying to maintain all these different missions. Tell me a bit about when HATS would be called to step in in search and rescue. For the mechanics here, the crew chiefs here at HATS, uh, we play a very big role in search and rescue. A good example of when we get called for search and rescue would be they get into a situation where Flight for Life can't get in there because of power limitations with their aircraft. They usually call us to come in and get them. And then, of course, we use the volunteer rescue teams, Vale and Aspen, who are our EMTs in a sense, that do all the patient stuff. It's a pretty small unit. There's 30 some of us here. After you fly with certain guys for a while, you know what they do good and what they don't do good. So it kind of makes it better. So when a student pilot returns home to their base, what's the impact of the training here as they move forward? A lot of the students that come through here are at sea level. Anywhere you go in the world, it'll still apply. So I think it's huge when it comes to overall safety, crew safety, even the crew chiefs get a different picture for what, what we're doing in the helicopter. And, it, and overall, it makes everybody safer. When we get an aviator graduated on Friday at the end of course eval or check ride, they go on to their unit and possibly onto an immediate deployment. Our aviators in theater have said, hey, 
Just so you guys know, your training was so invaluable to me and it actually kept me from getting into an accident and it helped improve our overall mission readiness. That was so cool getting a day in the life at Hats where some of the world's most elite aviators train in high alpine flying. Now, we've been here since 6 a.m., so I think it's about time to get back to Denver. So, we've made it back to Denver, and while you might not be able to visit Hats, you can come visit us here at Wings Over the Rockies and check out some of the helicopters in our collection, like the Huey. Now, we couldn't cover everything, so drop your questions and comments under the video and we'll get to as many as we can. And if you subscribe, thank you so much. If you don't subscribe, just subscribe already. Got plenty of power, not much wind.